Hi, this is Derek C. Moss, Professor of English and Interdisciplinary Studies at SUNY Potsdam. Welcome to A Deeper Dive into African American Literature, a daily series of short podcasts produced in conjunction with SUNY Potsdam's Celebration of Black History Month in 2021. Each day this February, we'll be looking at and listening to the work of an African American writer whose name may not be as familiar as Frederick Douglass, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, or Toni Morrison. But these writers' contributions help give us a much fuller picture of Black artists' roles in shaping American culture. Episode 28, Britt Bennett. Although she's only two books into her promising career, Britt Bennett has rapidly become one of the most noteworthy young African-American writers of fiction. Educated at both Stanford and the University of Michigan, Bennett first made a splash with a widely discussed essay entitled I Don't Know What to Do with Good White People that she published in 2014 on the feminist website Jezebel. Echoing work by James Baldwin and ta Coates, Bennett's essay expressed her frustration with well-meaning but ultimately ineffectual white anti-racist allies in the wake of the Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown killings. Her debut novel, The Mothers, received glowing reviews upon its appearance in 2016, and her follow-up, The Vanishing Half, quickly became a bestseller and one of the most celebrated books of 2020. The following excerpt from The Vanishing Half sets the stage for the story of the ways that the lives of a pair of identical twins diverge during the three decades after they both run away from the oppressive dullness of their Louisiana hometown as teenagers. The morning one of the lost twins returned to Mallard, Lou LeBon ran to the diner to break the news. And even now, many years later, everyone remembers the shock of sweaty Lou pushing through the glass doors, chest heaving, neckline darkened with his own effort. The barely awake customers clamored around him, ten or so, although more would lie and say that they'd been there too, if only to pretend that this once, they'd witnessed something truly exciting. In that little farm town, nothing surprising ever happened, not since the Vini twins had disappeared. But that morning in April 1968, on his way to work, Lou spotted Desiree Veen walking along Partridge Road, carrying a small leather suitcase. She looked exactly the same as when she'd left at 16, still light, her skin the color of sand barely wet, her hipless body reminding him of a branch caught in a strong breeze. She was hurrying, her head bent, and, Lou paused here, a bit of a showman, she was holding the hand of a girl, seven or eight, and as black as tar. Blue-black, he said, like she flown direct from Africa. Lou's egg house splintered into a dozen different conversations. The line cook wondered if it had been Desiree after all, since Lou was turning 60 in May and still too vain to wear his eyeglasses. The waitress said that it had to be. Even a blind man could spot a veen girl, and it couldn't have been that other one. The diners abandoning grits and eggs on the counter didn't care about that veen foolishness. Who on earth was the dark child? Could she possibly be Desiree's? Well, who else's could it be, Lou said. He grabbed a handful of napkins from the dispenser, dabbing his damp forehead. Maybe it's an orphan that got took in. I just don't see nothing how nothing that black could have come out of Desiree. Desiree seemed like the type to take in no orphan to you. Of course she didn't. She was a selfish girl. If they remembered anything about Desiree, it was that, and most didn't recall much more. The twins had been gone 14 years, nearly as long as anyone had known them. Vanished from bed after the Founders Day dance, while their mother slept right down the hall. One morning, the twins crowded in front of their bathroom mirror, four identical girls fussing with their hair. The next, the bed was empty, the covers pulled back like any other day, taut when Stella made it, crumpled when Desiree did. The town spent all morning searching for them, calling their names through the woods, wondering stupidly if they'd been taken. Their disappearance seemed as sudden, as sudden as the rapture. All of Mallard, the sinners left behind. For more information about Bennett and her work, click on the link above to visit her personal website. Check back tomorrow at the link at the bottom of the screen for another episode of A Deeper Dive into African American Literature. While you're there, you'll be able to find links to all of the previous episodes in the series, as well as links to booksellers from whom you can purchase these authors' works. And please, if you've enjoyed this series so far, help us spread the word. Thanks and gratitude go out to Clifton Harkham, Jason Hunter, and Alex Jacobs Wilkie at SUNY Potsdam, as well as to David Summerstein and Bonnie North at North Country Public Radio. Yeah.